Good evening, everybody. My name's Dr. Lex Major. I'm a, a reader in exercise physiology, and I'm the director of research and innovation in the School of Sport and Exercise Sciences, which is based in the University of Kent. In my talk today, I'm going to go through and give you some insights into how sport and exercise science can help us understand a bit more about future human. So we define human enhancement or augmentation as an intervention that's designed or used to restore or improve human performance, therefore overcoming the limits of one's human body or mind. Now, discussions in this area usually focus on pushing the boundaries of performance for the elite. So for example, an elite sporting population where we try and improve their, their physical or their cognitive performance. But importantly, when we're talking about human enhancement or augmentation, we also mean restoration of impaired function as well. So back to, back to normal or average levels. So when we think about this, we think about using technology or engineering or pharmacology perhaps to enhance human functions. And in this kind of vein, I guess we tend to think about perhaps superheroes or comic books or, or films or TV, where we have characters who have improved strength or sensory perception or, or memories or intelligence or, or reaction time. And that might seem a bit far-fetched and a bit too fictional for, for reality, but looking at superheroes and science fiction to explore human augmentation really isn't as crazy as it sounds. And indeed, there's, there's lots of different examples um, where reality really isn't too far from the fiction that we see on, on, on TV or in the cinema. So there's lots behind this and there's lots of different fields that it includes. And I realize that it all sounds perhaps a little bit out there and that I'm talking about things that you think might never happen. So I wanna give you an example that's happened in my lifetime, but I think relates to this. And it's about mobile phones. Now, I'm not all that old. <laughs> Um, but I got my, my first mobile phone when I was a teenager. It was called a Philips Savvy or a Philips C12. And it allowed me to store a grand total of 10 text messages. So I could have 10 text messages, text messages on that phone before the storage ran out and I had to delete some before I could receive another message. It had an aerial at the top that you could unscrew and screw back on and it had a massive battery in the back, which meant that the phone lasted for a full five days before I'd have to recharge it. But essentially, all I could use that phone for was phone calls and, and text messages. As a teenager, that was absolutely revolutionary in comparison to what I'd had access to before. It allowed me to text my girlfriend, I could call my parents and ask them to pick me up from football if it finished early, or I could go out and meet my friends and I could change the location we were going to meet without having to rely on finding a landline and hoping my friends were already at home and hadn't left the house yet. So the freedom and the form in which I was able to communicate using a mobile phone was, was completely different to what I had access to uh, before, before 2000 when I had that, that, that mobile phone. So that transition was, was, was incredibly different um, in, in a very short space of time. But now consider the next 20 years. Compare my Philips C12 that I had back in the year 2000 and compare it to what a modern smartphone can do and what it allows you to do. I would suggest really that probably text messages and phone calls are probably the things that you use your phone for the least. So even on my old iPhone that I have in front of me now, I can check my emails, I can read the news, I can see how many steps I've done today. I can check Twitter, look at the weather, I could watch iPlayer or download a podcast, or I could listen to a presentation on Zoom. Now, for the me of 20 years ago, those were probably things that I wouldn't be particularly interested in. But even still, 20 years ago, for me to imagine that kind of functionality on a mobile phone that everybody pretty much in the whole world would have was completely unthinkable. It was something that I would never have thought would have been possible. So now what I'd like to, you to think of as an, as an audience is think about 
how every single part of your life is affected by a mobile phone, how you use it in everyday life, how different companies use it, how businesses use it, how the NHS uses it, and what would happen if that were to be taken away. So if mobile phones suddenly, suddenly didn't exist, how would life change? And I would suggest probably everyday life as you know it would probably collapse. So what's happened over the last 20 to 30 years in terms of mobile technology has been absolutely phenomenal. And I, what I'd like you to, to think about is in our lifetime, I think we will probably see similar life-changing technologies which enhance human function or allow humans to be augmented in some way. And really when we're talking about future human and the research and the study behind this signature theme, this is really what we're talking about. We're talking about new technology which enhances human capability and the impact this is gonna have on our everyday lives.